Popcorn Poops is brought to you by Audible.com. Please visit audibletrial.com slash popcorn poops for a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of their subscription service. Audible is the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. Audible.com is offering a free audiobook download to listeners of Popcorn Poops along with a 30-day trial of their services. This week we're recommending the ultimate history of video games from Pong to Pokemon. The Story Behind the Craze That Touched Our Lives and Changed the World by Stephen Kent, narrated by Dan Warren. To download this or another audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash popcornpoops. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash popcornpoops for your free audiobook. We are the Popcorn Poops. Hey everyone, and welcome to Popcorn Poops, the best married couple movie podcast slash commentary track hybrid audio program on the internet. My name is Dustin. And I'm Jessica. This month, our theme is video game adaptations, and my pick for this week's episode is Paul W.S. Anderson's 1995 film, Mortal Kombat. If you are syncing this recording up to the movie, go ahead and start the film, and then press pause as soon as the new line cinema vanity card completely fades to black. It's time to start the movie. Sinkers, press play at the beep after the countdown. Ready? Three, two, one. And, uh, we're, I mean, it's not going to get better than this. I'm just going to say it. What you're hearing right now as we start this, there is nothing in this movie that is better than what we're hearing right now. Than, than the theme song? The theme song, which... Might be the greatest workout song ever. Yeah, it is. It's. I, I mean, mean it's it totally is. Really pumps you up, and uh, I, I think that the soundtrack in general is probably the best thing about this movie. It's, you know, it's kind of classless in the way that you know, really over the top like house music and electronic music has to be. Um, but you know, I, I think it does its job more than any one other element of this movie or other actor I will even even say <laughs> any of the performances no, there's nothing in this movie that's as good as the theme song and you know the subsequent soundtrack yeah it's a it's a great theme song uh it's fun to you know you want to go do some aerobics or go running on the treadmill or you know beat the shit out of someone right, rip out their yeah. spine you know mm -hmm tear off your face revealing finish a skull them. and yes to if you in fact want to finish him or her then this then is sure, the song to do it to song. yes of course yeah awesome actually i really do love the song yeah it's i mean like I, i'm, I'm I, like I, we're I, making fun of it but actually i i think it's fun I think oh it's, it's a, a fun it's song. a totally fun song and then that kind of like i said kind of classless you know it's it's there's no finesse to it whatsoever no, it's just no. It's, but it's it's great though. I mean, <laughs> the lyrics to the song are the Mortal, Mortal names. Kombat, <laughs> test your might, and the characters' names. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, it works though. I do love it. Um, otherwise, though, as for this movie, I kind of hate you. So thanks. Yeah, I'm thanks sorry. For this. You had to watch this. So I watched this last week and took notes and and pre prepared for for this podcast. And it had probably been the first time in geez, like 10 years or more since I had sat down to watch this, like start to finish without like, you know, going to YouTube and looking up clips and being like, oh, I remember this dumb little part, you know, look up some stupid thing that Christopher Lambert says in the movie or something like that. But this is a truly terrible movie. Yeah, it's awful. This had, is just awful. Had it not, I said this to you earlier, but had it not been for us doing The Room uh, several episodes back a few months ago, uh, this would be, without a doubt, the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, objectively worst movie that we've done on Popcorn Poops. I mean, the thing is, though, I think it is the worst movie we've done on Popcorn Poops, because the thing about The Room is that there are still redeeming qualities to it. Like, if if you watch it, um, you know, you can laugh a lot, yeah. because it's, it's so bad. Right. Like, there, it, The Room hits that level where sure. it gets so bad that it's good again it's, it wraps around i don't so. think this ever gets there no it doesn't it's this just isn't so bad boring. it's good it's yeah it is it's it's mostly boring and the things that you can that you can you know get out of the room the things that make the room a watchable experience um the, the, none of that is here there's nothing that's redeemable about this movie like you sit and watch the room and you're like oh my god i can't believe they're for real are they for they're for real this isn't a joke this is oh right. wow they're for and then you're laughing because yeah, yeah. it's funny that's not like this this is just i mean the jokes just run flat 
most yeah, of the, the time. Yeah, the jokes fall flat all the time. Um, there's there's no characters. What are those? What like, are characters? Ca- what's character development? What is that? I don't even have any How idea. How to dialogue. It, yes. Um, I mean, it's just... It's just a performances are bad. The writing is terrible. There are no themes to speak of. It's just one thing to the like it. I guess in it is true to form. It is true to its its source material, and that's a video game where you go from one fight to the next. Like there's a whole there's a whole part of this movie where it is just fight, just Just fighting. Then next fight. It's just one fight, and then the next fight in the tournament, and then the next fight in the tournament with no buffers in between. It's you get like four or five fights in a row. And that would be fine if the choreography was good, if it was like, at the end of the day, say what you will about the writing, say what you will about the performances, that it's kind of a good science, or not science fiction, why did I say science fiction? I guess there is a little bit of that in here, too. Yeah, there is. But um, martial arts movie, I mean to say. Um, I think that had that come across, then you might have something here. Well, I mean, think of how many martial arts movies are out there that are just utter shit they're just oh, yeah. horrible but they're still good martial arts movies sure. like they're still well regarded as like oh you've got to watch this one because oh my god he kicks his ass and it's so right. great and you got to watch his movies. i mean even the greatest There's none of that in e- here even the greatest martial arts films story-wise or the ones that are considered to be the greatest story-wise are basically just patchwork it's just what gets us to the next set piece where we can see some really awesome choreography and some really amazing human stunts and things like that um, this is basically that, except that there's nothing enjoyable about the fights. Yeah. I kind of broke down. There's a fight that happens later on um, where the three main characters, Sonya Blade, Johnny Cage, who we're watching uh, beat up people right now, and Liu Kang, they all have a fight with a bunch of like ninja people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as we're watching the scene, the thing that I kept saying to you was, this is one shot that you will get one move in. You're going to get one the next move. Shot, and the next shot is one move. A different move. And the next shot is a different move. And the next shot is a different move. It's not like the camera just sits there and allows you to appreciate the fight oh, choreography. Oh, man, it took some time for them to get that down, stunts. man. They had to practice that a lot. They had right. to make sure that their hands were in the right. No, it's none of, it's none of that. They just, okay, this time swing your leg like this. Okay, we got it. Good. Yep. Next one. <laughs> okay, this one a, jump up in the air really high. Okay, there's good. Even a, a really got it. hilariously Take. out of place moment where Liu Kang like flips over like a like the stairs or something just to and pose. And there's like no one there. There's it's no one just, there. He just, just flips over and poses and it cuts away. And it's like, okay, he did that. Why? I guess he had to get from point A to point B, but I don't know. It, it just looks really silly in or out of context. There's just yeah. no way to make it look right. Um, but so we've we've been talking over you know giving our our general impressions of this movie, which are very, very, very extremely negative. Uh, But we haven't really talked about what's been going on. So the movie opens with uh, the character of Shang Tsung fighting Liu Kang's brother, Chan. Chan Kang, I guess. I guess. I I guess. Um, And and Shang Tsung is uh, played by Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa, who you might know from such uh, cinematic works as Johnny Tsunami. Point. On on the Disney Channel, <laughs> you don't remember Johnny Tsunami? Oh, that's that's too bad. Yeah, he played the like the wise grand wise grandfather surfer person who grandfather surfer. Grand, yeah, he's a surfer. Like that whole movie's about surfing. So okay. like he's he's the one that passes down his wisdom about surfing? surfing. Yeah, to the young okay. Johnny Tsunami, the the titular character. Um, and in that first scene, Shang Tsung kills. Uh, Liu Kang's brother, and then we see that Liu Kang is, has woken up from a nightmare where he's go walks across the room, and the room's like really super green, and I kind of like that about it. Yeah. I don't know, there's something kind of pleasing about that super. Crazy they do that green a few apartment. times where they have like areas that are just certain colors, like they do it again yeah. with blue, and then they do yeah, it they again do with red later on in yeah, the movie. Yeah, th- there is some visual stuff in this movie that I some of the sets are cool think, too. Yeah, I, the production design overall I think is is good. Um, but it's everything else that sucks. Which is like most of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stay positive though. I'm gonna try to when something good happens or there's a there's a positive element. I do wanna you know to bring it up. Uh, but after that we see we see that Liu Kang has received a, a telegram that is very very blunt and to the point. It just says brother dead. 
Come home now. Gra- signed grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> signed grandfather. And then we had the um, the scene where uh, they were running through the dance. It was like a place nightclub or something. In Hong Kong. Yeah, they were in Hong Kong, and we we get introduced to the character of Sonia Blade, who's with. She was chasing Kano. Right, uh, who's with? She's with Jax, who is also a character from Mortal Kombat, but he doesn't really get a chance to do anything in this movie because she leaves him uh, to go to this tournament thing, and he's left behind. Jax is famous in the games for being the uh, character with like cybernetic arms. Mm. So, and I don't think he uh, he actually shows up in the second game. I think for the first time, there the was movie. a scene. There was a scene, a moment in the in the dance room where they started shooting guns. Yeah. And the people just kept dancing. Yeah. and They were hardcore dancers. I mean, they're raiding this place because they're looking for another character named Kano, who was... The reason Sonya's looking for Kano is because he killed her partner and she wants revenge. And, of course, we find that out through someone, you know, just saying it Saying it out, right. Of course. Right. Uh, and and Shang, Shang Tsung is also there. And apparently it was he that orchestrated the whole thing to have Kano kill her partner so that he could lure her onto this big leaky boat to go to this Mortal Kombat tournament. And the movie continually goes back to... Uh, Shang Tsung really is interested in Sonya for some reason. And they never resolve that. They they kind of do, and we'll, we'll get to it oh. at the end, but it's maybe the dumbest reason imaginable. Now, this is just a great moment here. Oh, We've the reveal. We've got Liu Kang, uh, and, <laughs> and we're about to see Lord Raiden. Lord Raiden, oh yes, this white man. <laughs> this white man who is apparently... The Lord of these monks. Yes, he is. He is the. Uh, although they are in, they are at what they call in the movie the Temple of Light, which I don't know. I don't think is an actual real place, but they say that it is in China, uh, and they call him their Lord of Lightning and Thunder. Raiden, of course, being a take on. Well, Raiden is a character in the game, of course, but right. the character from the game. He's a thunder god. Who's a thunder god of thunder and lighten, lightning? Who is based on the Shinto god of Daijin? Daijin, yeah. Or okay. uh, sometimes referred to as a Daiden, but uh, the the kanji for Daijin being uh, thunder and god, like literally thunder god. Yeah. But that's Japan, and this is China. It is. It is and China. S- I think someone forgot that they're two different countries. They are with two different mythologies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. Just this white guy comes. And also, I really love that um, everyone in China just speaks English to each other, like, privately. Oh, yeah. And, like, when they're talking to mass groups of other Chinese people, they just all all speak English. It's all the... That's good. It's those little details that could have taken this from being a really shitty adaptation... Of at at the end of the day, and we're I'm event, I was going to eventually say this anyway, but it's a really shitty adaptation of a really shitty video game. <laughs> Mortal Kombat sucks. It is terrible. You're gonna get some hate. Oh, I I don't care. Like I I haven't played any of the recent Mortal Kombat games. So and as I understand it, they've kind of come into their own. Uh, you know, post you know the 3D thing. I guess post Mortal Kombat 4 when it became a 3D game. Um. I understand that they've come into their own and they've got like their own, you know, kind of intrigue to them. And, you know, they've developed their own kind of balance and all that kind of thing. All the things that you want out of a fighting game with good fighting game mechanics. But um, the original Mortal Kombat game just feels like it exists solely for shock value. I tried to play it yesterday. I, uh, I, I fired it up for the first time in years and uh, tried to play uh, a couple of rounds and it is so stiff, and it is so clunky, and I, I can't imagine anyone wanting to play this for any other reason than that they can turn on the blood and do the finishing moves where they can do crazy shit like rip people's spines out of their, their yeah. bodies and shit like that. I mean, I am um, I I really haven't played Mortal Kombat much. To be completely honest, I'm not a, a fighting game kind of person whatsoever. I definitely stick to RPGs and action RPGs and... And platformers and things like that, and I really just have never gotten into any fighting games. Yeah. Um, I I've played Street Fighter a little bit. I spent like a weekend trying to accomplish success. 
at well, Street Fighter, and, and know, I just can't get into it. The, the eternal playground debate is Mortal Kombat versus Street Fighter, which is the better fighting game. And to me, that's not even a question. Like, like Street Fighter has actual mechanics. Like, there's actual balance in the game. There's, there's uh, skill involved, I, I would even say, like, versus Mortal Kombat, where there doesn't seem to be any. I remember as a kid, if you pick Sub-Zero and you know how to do his freezing move, freeze and uppercut, freeze and uppercut, freeze and uppercut, you will finish the entire game and you will beat anyone who you play against, unless, of course, they play as Sub-Zero as well. Or Scorpion, who has a move where he, you know, shoots uh, his spear out and pulls you across the screen to him, where he, where you're then like stunned, so he can uppercut you then and then take like half of your life bar. I don't know. It's just there are a few characters with a couple of moves that are totally and completely broken, and it throws the balance of the entire game off. And that's not to speak that that doesn't even speak to how stiff the controls feel just in general. So. A shitty movie adapted from a shitty game. I mean, you're just, you're not going to get, I don't, I don't see how there's going to be a good product that comes out of that unless you've got someone on board who knows how to take the, you know, the skeleton, the idea, the images of the game, what makes the game iconic and turn it into a kind of fun, cool Kung Fu movie. And they, they didn't do that. I don't, I also, and again, I, I, I am sure at some point in my life of video games, I have sat down and played a round or two of Mortal Kombat. I'm sure that's happened before, but I can't recall it specifically, so I definitely don't know very much at all about these games. Well, now I do because I did a bunch of research, but um, but where where the hell does the story come from? Like, if it's like playing through Street Fighter, I mean... I know there's background to all those characters, but you get so little in the game, so I mm-hmm. I don't understand. I know this movie is, is really, really based That's... off... Are you serious? Yeah, a lot of the story from those old fighting games and stuff comes from the instruction you manuals. You just read the instruction manuals, yeah. and that tells you the story mm-hmm. in the game. Yeah, sure. This is why I can't play fighting games. Like it, The point of it, to me, is just so... And I mean, you know, if it's something like Soul Calibur, where you just mash buttons repeatedly, then, you know... I guess I guess I can find some enjoyment in that for like a round. Sure. But I don't have the patience to sit and learn a bunch of combo moves that are yeah. irritating to learn and Okay, so getting back to the movie, uh we were introduced to Johnny Cage in a scene where he's fighting a bunch of people and it turns out he's on a movie set and uh the the director that they have directing this movie was apparently supposed to actually be Steven Spielberg. Cuz apparently Steven Spielberg was a huge fan of like Mortal Kombat or just video games in general. Huh. And I've heard that before, that, that okay. Steven Spielberg is something of a gamer. So he was supposed to make the cameo, but then couldn't do it at the last minute or something like that. And I just got to say, he dodged a fucking bullet. Yeah. The guy that they got to do the, the role of the director, uh, they make up to look like Steven Spielberg. And he's very obviously supposed to be a Steven Spielberg. But Steven Spielberg has not and will never make a martial arts movie. You know, there was a really funny line, though, after that, and it's only funny because of the movie, like the situation of the movie. Mm. But Johnny Cage is like, he says to the director, I'm going to shoot myself for being in your movie. <laughs> and I'm just like, so this is real then? <laughs> we're, we're really talking to the real director and this is the real actor speaking? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure that something like that was said to Mr. Paul W.S. Anderson, who's made uh, other gems such as, well, he launched the Resident Evil franchise. Ah, He's directed a couple of those entries, you know, of course, the first one, and then I think maybe the most recent one. Uh, he also did the, the first Alien vs. Predator movie. Okay. That, that little gem. Okay, great. Um, he has made one movie that I think is legitimately a good movie, and that's Event Horizon. Okay, so yeah. That's that's kind of fun. It's got some weird, creepy, you know, nutty stuff in it. Uh, and I like, you know, Lawrence Fishberg and Sam Neill. So, you know, at least he's got one under his belt. And, you, you know, Paulie W.S. Anderson, you can say what you want about him as a filmmaker. And what you'll probably say is that he sucks. But as far as filmmakers who kind of have, to some degree, leaned on video game adaptations during their career... Well, I mean, without Uva Boll, he would be the worst. 
Uva Bowl, it, like <laughs> his entire career has basically been, I'm going to adapt to video games and not only make bad movies, but make some of the worst movies ever made, period. Uh-huh. And he continually does that. He started, I think his first one was like House of the Dead, and he did Blood Rain. I think he's done a couple of Blood Rain movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did a Postal adaptation. Uh, he did a Far Cry adaptation. He did a Dungeon Siege adaptation. And all of them, all of them are hot are just, garbage. Just piles. Yeah, they're terrible. Just steaming piles. Um, so we missed one of my favorite uh, reoccurring, I don't know what you want to call it, motifs in this. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> where, where, where randomly, like one, one of the three main characters, I guess, uh, Johnny Cage, Luke Kane, and, and Sonya Blade, um, one of them will walk away yeah. somewhere, and then the <laughs> other two will just follow. Yeah, just in like the next, like they'll walk off and do like Something one minor thing. Yeah, one minor thing by themselves, and then the other two will join them. They do that at least three or four times throughout the movie. Like in the first one, though, is my favorite because because Sonya walks off and she goes downstairs into the ship and. That's where we we get all our random exposition about her being the chosen one. And well, I don't know that she's the chosen one. She, no, because Luke Kang well, is referred to. He says she's chosen, though. She is chosen, right? But don't get that confused with the, the chosen, chosen one, one. Right. which is apparently what Luke Kang is. So Luke Kang is is doing this tournament because his brother died and he wants revenge on Shang Tsung. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, Sonya is she's not really. Well, she never has a moment where she decides to actually do the tournament. She just wants to get Kano for killing As her I partner. understand in the game, the way the story goes in the game that I guess you get from reading the instruction manual, um, yeah. <laughs> is that she was Oh, following... we just missed the best line. Oh. The best line in the movie, Christopher Lambert. And it's kind of an inexplicable joke, uh, inexplicable as to why it's really funny. I, I feel like it's funny the way it's supposed to be funny, but also there's something about it that feels like you're kind of laughing at the joke and not with the joke, if that makes sense. But (laughs) Christopher Lambert says he's all dead serious because they play all of this totally straight. Raiden. And uh, yeah, yeah, Raiden, sorry. I keep referring to the actor. And he says, billions of lives depend on you. And then he laughs maniacally. (laughs) (laughs) And then says, sorry. (laughs) And you're just like, what? It's so random because like... Like I don't know. But I, I'm gonna, I mean, it's it legitimately make any funny. Sense. It is legitimately funny. I think because the whole the whole scene up to that is really serious, and they've answered a bunch of questions like why can people suddenly, you know, shoot scorpions out of their hands and and I guess it's not a scorpion. It's, it's a, a something. Snake it's a snake guy. Thing, I'm not sure. Whatever. I don't know. But we just we when Shang Tsung just announced the beginning of the tournament. I guess. Uh, he was on the boat, and some smoky stuff starts appearing that looks kind of like Aurora Borealis that turns into a guy like that looks vaguely something. like a samurai and like a skull wearing a samurai helmet with snakes coming out of his eyes. And he says it has begun, which is just repeating the line that Raiden said like literally six seconds before. All this stuff starts happening, and Raiden goes, It has begun. Six seconds later, Shang Tsung says, it has begun. Yeah, they do that a couple times. There's there's a thing later with um, what's her name, Pr- Princess Katana, yeah. uh, where like she gives Liu Kang some advice, and then like in the very next scene, like it's got to be like less than a minute later, she oh, yeah, pops like, up in the distance, and she's like, like her advice is repeated, like in you know yeah. his head, like the whisper while she's it's looking narrated at him. over it. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so what I was saying though before was. Uh, about Sonya's story. Yeah, so her story in the game is that she is just following Kano onto the ship. Like, she doesn't know anything about the ship or anything. And I guess that's sort of the same here, but uh, her squad of guys goes with her. She's uh, she's a, she's Lieutenant mm-hmm. Sonya Blade, and she's in the United States Special Forces. Okay. And her her squad, I guess, her people with her, go onto the boat, too, when they follow Kano, and then they show up at the island, and then Shang Tsung tells her that he's going to kill all her people if she doesn't fight in the tournament, and so that's why she fights in the tournament. But then he kills her people anyway, so it doesn't right, matter. Right, of course he does. 
But anyway, so at least like in the game, there's a reason why she fights in the tournament. I don't know yeah, why she not, does it here. I, let, let, okay, so we, we we started to try to kind of I'm break. sorry, where did Johnny Cage get all these bags from? I don't know. We saw Liu Kang throw his one bag into the water like a dick. Like a dick. <laughs> Let's be clear. This movie wants Johnny Cage to be the dick. This movie wants Johnny Cage to be the egomaniacal you know, actor Hollywood guy that's totally unlikable until he comes around and realizes that he has to be selfless and, you know, earnest and all that kind of stuff. That's the obvious character arc that they're wanting from him. But Liu Kang is so much more of an asshole than he is. <laughs> like, dude walks by. So the dude walks, uh, I guess, Liu Kang walks by Johnny Cage on the docks. And we saw this earlier. Johnny Cage is like, hey, here's some money. Uh, take the bags and put them on the boat because he mistakes Liu Kang for a, a dock worker. And Liu Kang is like, you want me to carry your bags? And he's like, yeah. So he's like, okay. He takes his money and throws his luggage into the water. <laughs> but was there more luggage there on the dock? Like around Johnny Cage I, I or something? No, I didn't I see I mean, it. we just had a scene where he was walking up the mountain with like 30 bags. It was supposed to be right. comical. It's, of course, it's supposed to be com- comedy. <laughs> but. But it was. And then Luke Cage shows up just like I a minute later like when they're on the boat. Sonia and Johnny Cage kind of have a heated exchange. And uh, when Sonya walks off, Liu Kang walks up again with this shit-eating grin on his face and goes, just another starstruck fan, and walks away. Like he walks into frame, says, dick, 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 I'm a dick, 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 (laughs) dick, dick, and walks out of frame. That's... Like, repeatedly, it happens a lot. So, I I don't... And then, and like, all of that is, is predicated on this moment between Johnny Cage... And another character named Art Lean, who is not from the video games, he's just another martial artist that's showing up at the tournament. And Johnny Cage has like a real exchange with this dude, and he's like, hey man, I saw you fight in London. You were great. And, you know, Art Lean is like, man, I appreciate your movies too. Like, it's really cool. And they have this moment, and you're like, oh my God, Johnny Cage is kind he's, of a, he's kind of is like a, a real dude yeah. like that, that appreciates other martial artists, even though he's become kind of a movie star. Now, his whole arc in this is that uh, he has been accused by the press of being they'd never go into it more than this but they accuse him of being a fake which i think is probably supposed to parallel uh, actually we got a comment on our on our facebook uh from from our friend uh brian yes and uh he uh he asked about he probably knows a lot more about martial I'm arts sh- than most oh, he of the people does. in this he movie definitely does. So. i'm sure he knows a lot more about like mortal combat than, <laughs> than I mean us definitely, um, but he was he he mentioned something about the parallels between Johnny Cage and uh, uh, um, Jean Claude Van Damme, and if I recall correctly, Jean Claude Van Damme has kind of come up against you know some martial arts movie or kung fu movie fandom for being being exactly what Johnny Cage is kind of accused of, and this is just being a fake, just an actor who's not a real martial artist who is you know, portrayed as a martial artist because he's in martial arts movies. And I think that's because Jean-Claude Van Damme is, he was actually an acrobat. Like he's a gymnast, uh, and, and maybe a dancer. And he has used those, he has parlayed those skills into a career in martial arts movies. I do know that, um, that the character of Johnny Cage, if Wikipedia is to be believed, then it, he was supposed to be like a parody of Jean-Claude Van Damme, especially from the 1988 film Bloodsport. Oh, okay. Blood. All right, that makes sense. Um, actually, Jean-Claude Van Damme was supposed to play Johnny Cage in the movie as well, but he went off to make another turd called Street Fighter. <laughs> and you know what? I, I kind of wish we had picked Street Fighter instead. Yeah, is because, it better? I don't know um, if I've seen that one. I had seen this before, but I don't I, know if I've seen Street... Maybe I I've have. seen Street Fighter more recently than I had seen this uh, before You know this most recent rewatch. Um, but if my memory serves... Street Fighter is kind of one of those so bad it's good things. Uh, I recall Raul Julia uh, delivering a particularly cheesy and enjoyable performance as uh, M. Bison. Oh, I remember. I was really pissed in this scene because... uh, So it's like the dinner scene and then for whatever reason, Shang Tsung brings out some fighters and then they fight and whatever but when the fighters come out like there's food all over the table they've just brought out all this they've food they've just brought out all this food and it looks delicious it i really think it's supposed to be that like a uh, filipino dish what what's it called 
a uh, paella, paella, yeah, um, where it's like a rice dish with a bunch of seafood and stuff in it, and it's so delicious, and. And it looks like there are these huge plates of it covering the tables. And the fighters come in and they just start, for no reason, I guess, to clear space. They just start throwing the tables and the food everywhere. And I was really upset. And then they do it later in the movie, too. This movie has a thing about setting a really nice table of food and then destroying it. Oh, yeah. Shortly after. Because <laughs> they do, they, that a couple they times, do it they? later when in the room where. Um, when Kano's Prince eating. Goro. Prince Goro, who we see right here, kind of uh, obscured, but uh, yeah, he he's eating with Kano, and that table is spread like mad, and yeah, they fuck it up too. And Kano's just later. eating by himself, like he's got all this food in front of him, and he's just sitting at the table by himself eating, and talking about things that we've just seen happen. Like it's, it, I think. We've got this moment here where Sonia has walked off by herself, and surprise, surprise, the other two walk up and join her. Yeah. Again, though, a really cool-looking set, I think. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. I think Um, there are a couple sets in this that, you know, they're fun. As I understand, a lot of these sets were, like, they took photographs of these sets and digitized them for, uh, like, a a, a direct-to-video animated Mortal Kombat movie. That came out sometime after really? this, and I think I had it when I was a kid. It was really like the animation was really workmanlike, very low, low quality, very obviously just meant to shovel as many copies into you know child's hands as possible, mm-hmm. yeah. and before they realized what a turd it was, kind of like the movie itself. So uh, in the next scene. We, like we were talking about before, we're going to have Kano sitting at the table, eating his feast, and talking about the things that we've just seen happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he just goes over beat for beat, uh, Shang Tsung walking in uh, and having his his fighter, Sub-Zero, freeze the dude and, you know, the guy explodes. Man, and they get this whole storyline, the, the Kano and Sonya thing, they get it out of the way fast. They're just like, okay, so she's come here to... to- kill him and then she just does and yeah. then it's 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 like what the second fight it's like yeah. guy who you don't know against Liu Kang I think and then the second fight is Sonya and Kano and it's like what oh and that's okay it. so we're done so she's she's we've completed her her well, story arc that, now and that's we're, her we're goal finished? but like even okay. then like that that's her goal and as a goal or as you know the the desire for a character to be uh, I guess fulfilled that early feels kind of anticlimactic, but as far as her character arc goes, uh, that's also completed in a really unsatisfying way at the end of the movie because her whole thing, like her her character flaw, is that she doesn't rely, which on is anybody. explained to us very explicitly, oh, very clearly, right? Um, multiple times. So yes. she like the, in Raiden. the very first moment of the very first scene that we see her and she's talking to Jax and she says there's one person on this planet that I trust and you're talking to her <laughs> it's a brill- brilliant line <laughs> and uh, so like throughout the movie we keep getting reminded that Sonya doesn't rely on people and she refuses to rely on anyone but herself she doesn't want to ask for help from anybody and that's that's fine um, but I guess that gets resolved at the end of the movie when she's fucking kidnapped and she doesn't have a choice but to rely on her friends to show up and save her. And Shang Tsung's like talking shit to her in her face, and she's like, "My friends will show up." Yeah, They're I really, I really don't feel like that's a character flaw though for a character like her because I mean, are there any other girls here besides Princess Katana? No, nope, none. So uh, yeah, she's kind of got to like balls up about everything. She's got to be super tough and not ask for help because if she asked for help for anything, they'd be like, "Oh, it's because you have a vagina." So I gotta say, we're we're getting our in this scene. We get our first clear look at Goro, and I gotta say, I kind of dig the puppet. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. They don't use any CG on him at all. It's just this big ass puppet. I'm sure there's a dude inside uh, that's operating. Like his legs are actually that's the legs, where they spend all their money. He's, is that where? Is that where, they that, they skipped the yeah, script? Goro Oh, and candles, apparently. <laughs> and candles. The there candle budget was just like candles. three million dollars. It was ridiculous. Um, and Kano's faceplate is like made of plastic. Do you see this mm-hmm. thing? Yeah, <laughs> it looks ridiculous. Yeah, it's just great. Uh, apparently, Kano originally was supposed to be of 
I think he was supposed to be of Chinese and Japanese descent or maybe Japanese American descent or something in the games. Uh, but they liked this actor's performance so much. When I say they, I mean the, uh, the, the original developers of Mortal Kombat. Uh, what, is, what are their names? Ed Boon and um, something Tobias. John Tobias. John Tobias. Yeah, because he Tobias. made Johnny Cage and I thought that was kind of interesting that oh, his right. name was also John. And Johnny Cage's actual name is John Carlton. So. Oh, okay. I see. So he actually just gave the character his name. So, uh, so yeah, Ed, Ed Boon and, and John Tobias liked this actor's performance so much as Kano that in future uh, Mortal Kombat games, they retconned his character to actually be Australian. But the actor it's himself, he's not Australian. He's actually English playing an Australian character just because he wanted to make Kano Australian, just because. But I think it kind of works. Yeah. I guess it kind of works for the character. Um, you know, another character, Liu Kang, was originally supposed to be he was supposed to be Japanese oh really originally yeah and his character was supposed to be named Minamoto Yoshitsune okay and uh but John Tobias said that they couldn't deal with the name <laughs> too, so just they too much it. name <laughs> <laughs> they, they could have just changed that's, his... that's a quote from wiki they I mean, couldn't deal with the name they could have named him Ken oh I guess oh, Street right, Fighter taken, yeah you know could only be one hero. Fan. We could do hero. Hero, yeah, that would work. That's an easy one. Yeah, I mean, he is like the happy protagonist, you know. Yeah, that that were, uh, that's been done before, but sure, why not? So we've got another moment here where you know the th- our three main characters were spying on Kano and his conversation with Goro. Shang Tsung walks in and is just talking about whatever, just whatever the fuck, whatever the fuck they're talking about. Uh, Shang, <laughs> Shang Tsung says something like, oh, Kano, the kind of, kind of man Kano is, he can amass a great fortune in, in uh, you See, know, this is blue. Everything's blue yeah. now. So now they're in these, these catacombs or these caverns or whatever, and Liu Kang has gone off by himself, and he's going to see Reptile. Who, Don't worry, he'll shortly be followed. <laughs> yes. Um, that's what I was actually going to mention, but so he, he gets attacked here by reptile who runs off reptile being another character from mortal Kombat, obviously who in the movie is sent by Shang Tsung to follow Kitana because she's important somehow. Like she's going to try to throw the, the tournament off track. Kitana being a 10,000 year old princess whose parents were killed by the current emperor who they never name in the movie. I don't think, but his name is Shao Kahn Mm -hmm. and uh, Shao Kahn kills her, her parents adopts her and then claims the throne of outworld. This place that they're in for himself. Are they in outworld now? Yes. I get really confused about where outworld is. Like, I mean, at the end it's very clear because they go through that whole portal tunnel thing. Right, which Raiden refers to what's on the other side of the portal as the wastelands of Outworld, and he says that he can't go there. But when they're on the boat headed to what at some point someone refers to as Outworld, like the place they're at right now is Outworld, uh, Shang Tsung reminds Raiden, to Raiden's chagrin, uh, that he has no dominion in Outworld. Okay. But Raiden totally does have power here, obviously. Like the, after yeah, this whole cause... scene right here, this and this is the fight scene that I was talking about before, where each each moment is just a single yeah. move. And next, yep, there's and a move, next, and then next, she, she gets a couple of things to do, and then we move on to the next one where it's just these Spin kick. slightly choreographed, very mildly choreographed moments, lots and lots of slow motion. I think that if you took all of the slow motion in this movie and <laughs> sped it up to normal speed, the movie would only be like 45 minutes oh, long. Oh, God. Why don't they do that? That's a great Please. idea, isn't it? That is the best idea. There is no reason for Actually, this movie to be an hour and 40 just, minutes long. We could just fast forward through the whole movie, and that would be an even better idea, actually. Or just not watch it. Yeah. So <laughs> they kill all these dudes or knock them out or whatever they do. And Raiden is about to show up and say, oh, well, it's real good that you knocked all these dudes out. What are you going to do about all those other dudes? And then there's a bunch of other dudes. A bunch of other dudes. And then they, they start to attack, there. and Raiden's like, no, no. And his he's got a little bit of lightning on his finger, and they're like, oh. Gets a little lightning eyes going on again. Oh, fuck. He walked across the floor in his socks, and he's got some static electricity going and on. That shit's going to hurt. So I guess he can do stuff here. 
he he threatens to. So right? why can't he go to the wastelands of Outworld? I don't know. I don't know why he's not fighting in the tournament. He's the protector of Earth, and he fights in the games, but he doesn't fight in this at all. The most he does is he, I, I don't know, he knocks out Scorpion and Sub Zero on the boat. Uh, he flips over Liu Kang when Liu Kang attacks him toward the beginning. That's about it. <sighs> Maybe it's because Christopher Lambert can't do anything. <laughs> but he was Tarzan. Christopher Lambert was Tarzan. And the Highlander. Come on. We're talking about the Highlander here. Right. But no. He's just got a shitty Gandalf wig on. <laughs> now, didn't you tell me that I have I have definitely not seen the second movie. I've seen Ooh. um Ooh. I've seen this one before a long time ago talk and about painful. then of course I've watched it recently for this. But in the sequel, didn't you say they replaced like almost all the actors? Yeah, I mean there's they're n- they they replace a solid, I mean of the five if you want to call the five main characters, Luke Kang, Johnny Cage, Son- Sonya Blade, Raiden and Kitana, they replace three of those actors. The only ones who stick around are Robin Sho, who plays uh, Liu Kang, and, um, oh, what's her name? Soto, what's her name? And they eventually, uh, in in the sequel, they cut Raiden's hair so oh, that... Oh, Talisa Soto plays uh, plays Kitana, and she comes back for the second one. They cut his hair, I'm They've guessing, in yeah. an attempt to maybe make it not so obvious to that mitigate he's you know the audience's you know reaction suspension of to, disbelief yeah, exactly. that this is this the same guy in the same gandalf wig? yeah they also take care of johnny cage pretty quick in that movie by killing him in like the first five minutes <laughs> the, the the movie the second movie picks up if i recall correctly the second movie picks up like the moment that this movie ends with the emperor coming back and the Emperor comes back and he's got his group of warriors and one of them just totally offs Johnny Cage by like breaking his back or something. Well, I know in the games, it in the original series at least, Johnny Cage dies like three times. Yeah, and it, I think in a couple of the games he's supposed to be a ghost. Okay. I think. That's cool, whatever. I don't know, such a weird character, like a Hollywood You know, martial Scorpion artist. is an undead ninja. Yes, I know he's supposed to be like a... Like a ghost or a specter. An they undead call him a... ninja specter. Okay. Specter ninja. Something and like he that. was killed by Sub-Zero and is out for revenge. I do remember that the first time I learned the word specter was <laughs> from <laughs> was from the Mortal Kombat uh, animated uh, thing that I was talking about before. That uh-huh. you know, piece of you know, direct-to-video garbage. Uh, I remember... Scorpion walking across one scene and two of the characters having an exchange saying, oh, he's a specter. And the other one going, what's a specter? Well, it's like a ghost. And I'm like, oh, now I know what specter is. Now I know. Yeah, in the games, he's supposed to be mostly neutral, actually. Like in this movie, both him and Sub-Zero are definitely bad guys working for Shang Tsung, like no question, right? But Mm. in the games, apparently they're supposed to be pretty neutral sub zero is supposed to be just i guess after shang Tsung's treasure yeah um and scorpion is there because he's trying to avenge himself and his ninja clan because of sub zero um yeah so we've got our first battle of mortal Kombat going on right now where Liu kang is facing off against some unnamed guy who I don't know, like if it's if Mortal Kombat, if the point of Mortal Kombat is so that people from Earth can fight and win the tournament to keep the people from the Outworld from invading the Earth realm, then yeah, it was like if they the rules were stated really fast and like brushed over, but it's something like if they win, if Outworld people win more than nine times, like if they win ten, ten times, times in, in a, a row, row, then. The, then the they portals will open Earth? and the emperor can invade Earth and take over Earth like he's taken over Outworld or something like that. Now, this whole thing right here where Shang Tsung says fatality, he says flawless victory like four times throughout the movie. He says fatality, I think, just this one time. I can't possibly imagine what it was like for, let's say, for example, my father who took me to see this movie in the theater for the for you know the first time that I saw it with my with my younger brother. Um, 
my father not knowing anything about the video games, probably not knowing at all what a what a fatality was in the context of the games, and then seeing a character like suck another character's soul out and say fatality. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's got to be like, ah, it's pretty on the nose. That guy, that guy's dead. <laughs> I mean, without the context of the games, it's a pretty silly thing to say. It's like if in, in any other movie, if if you know someone kill if a per- person kills another character, and then says fatality, they're not wrong. <laughs> but it's, it's just, just like, stupid. Why, okay, why are you saying that? <laughs> You're right. This it is the second fight. Yeah. The second fight here is Sonya versus Kano, and this completes like her goals as a character she wants revenge on Kano and I guess participating in the tournament just totally forgives the fact that she's a police officer or someone of some official capacity where she was raiding the nightclub before with her team to arrest Kano for the murder of her partner seems perfectly reasonable you know due process justice all that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff yeah Um, but now that she's decided inexplicably to take part in the tournament proper um she's just gonna kill him yeah she just outright kills him she breaks his neck with her legs in a way that looks like 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 he he is really acting so hard in the scene where he dies because she's just like squeezing his neck a little with her ankles (laughs) and you're just like like, what's going on like Like oh oh she she killed him that way okay all right yeah, in the game, I think she doesn't. Um, she doesn't kill him. Apparently, this movie is really close to the storyline of the first game of the original Mortal Kombat. Yeah, with Kombat. with some of the second game peppered in. Right, like there's some elements like Jax is not in the first game, but he makes an appearance in this movie because the second game was out at that point, so they right. kind of threw him a bone. Um, but so in the first game, she she doesn't kill him. She is going to arrest him. Um, she uh, can't, doesn't kill Kano till Mortal Kombat three, I think. Oh, but she does actually kill him. Like I, in... I think so in Mortal Kombat three. Okay. Um, but but actually in in two maybe uh, Jack shows up and arrests Kano. He arrests him, but then Kano escapes. Okay. Hmm. So they actually like do try to you know arrest him, but I... here she just. Straight up. What what is this shit? By the way, why why what are the rules of this tournament? You can just be anywhere at any point, and it's I, I, a legitimate well, I mean, battle. So we've we've got. I guess so. That's that was something that I was going to ask you. The first two tournaments are clearly officiated by Shang Tsung himself. He's sitting there, and there appears to be a ring of some kind. And then we cut to this forest here, where Johnny Cage and Scorpion are are facing off and there's no one else around Mm -hmm. and by the end of this battle they've gone through a portal to like some hellish looking place that i assume is i don't know like somewhere in outworld i guess like scorpion's apartment or something like that (laughs) i'm I'm not sure um yeah i'm i'm really confused about the the like rules to this okay because when i think of a be all end all like demonic battle tournament whatever i immediately go to yu yu haka show and the dark oh, tournament the anime. okay right um because it was a fun season and yeah it was just battle after battle after battle but i mean it happened in an arena and all of the storyline took place about dealing with the characters that they were fighting and if you're into that kind of anime oh, then the cg is so terrible um then it's fun but like the rules were very specific and because it was a season about a tournament it was about the tournament and this is just like random like people just fight anywhere at any time yeah. who is who is deciding who wins and who loses and Cheng Tsung doesn't get to suck the souls out of people unless he's going to be like wandering around the whole island I don't know like the the, the thing about this movie is is that it kind of it it follows the pattern of, of another of well, not another an actual great martial arts film called Enter the Dragon, a Bruce Lee movie, where you've got like three main character fighters who go to this island to participate in a tournament. And as the movie goes on, the 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 
official fights become less and less official until it's the point where uh, famously uh, Bruce Lee's character is walking around in that that hallway of mirrors and he's looking for his his opponent and all of that's going on and there's no one like officiating really it's more like him just on this kind of uh, quest or this adventure like it kind of evolves mm. into that yeah but this movie just goes back and forth from like officiated matches to this stuff where they're just fighting randomly. It And it is like, and the thing is, is that, um, and sometimes the officiated matches that take place in little circles drawn in the sand, sometimes a bunch of people are watching and sometimes it's only Shang Tsung. Yeah. And, and my whole thing is why would anyone go fight in the circle then? Yeah. Why, why would anyone go there? Because obviously the advantage is to like run around and. Well, now you're getting it. You're, use you're the island. You're you're getting into something that is kind of close to another plot point that they bring up later in the movie, and that is that apparently if you refuse to fight, or if you were like specifically in the case of uh, Shang Tsung wants to challenge Sonya, so he kidnaps her and takes her into the wastelands of Outworld where Raiden can't go, so that he can tie her up. And put her in a really stupid slave yeah, dress, slave yeah. lady dress, and challenge her to the final battle of Mortal Kombat. But Raiden says that, or he hints at the thing that Liu Kang just happens to know, that if she doesn't accept the challenge, there can be no last last battle. They don't explain exactly what the consequences of that are, and well, Shang then- Tsung actually says that if she refuses, then the portals will open and... Earth because will be Earth invaded. Forfeits. Because he Earth forfeits, like but like I get the feeling that he's lying. Like I feel like he's supposed to be lying because about that. Because then, like they say something about you can't win based on treachery or yeah, something. Yeah, it's really exactly. confusing. It's, it, well, it, none of it makes sense, and none of it's set in stone. And I feel like if the point of that is, is if that if you refuse the battle, if you refuse the challenge, then Mortal Kombat ends, and there's no way for the Emperor to invade. I don't know why these people aren't just like, fuck you, I'm not fighting. Well, yeah, and that that's like, like I said, um, if if these matches aren't really officiated, if it can just be random people running through the woods and suddenly attacking each other, then why does Liu Kang ever fight Kitana? Why does that happen at all? Because obviously they don't, don't want to fight each other because they spend like the two minute battle just sort of like dancing around each other and then whispering hints about the next battles like like it's totally stupid so why would they if they aren't forced to fight each other then why are they doing it I, I'm not sure and I don't know why people by different people from earth are fighting each other like Kano's clearly from earth and Sonya's clearly from earth but if Mortal Kombat is about earth versus outworld and the earth people versus the outworld people I guess. And if it's not, then why okay. don't this, like? I wanted to talk about this moment. So Johnny, K- we just talked over this entire battle because it's you know uh, stupid, it's dumb. <laughs> um, but Johnny Cage just laid the smack down on Scorpion, and at the end of the battle, he like cuts him up uh, as he's in his finishing move uh, form, where he's taken off his mask and his face to reveal a skull, and he's breathing fire and all this stuff. And Johnny Cage starts slashing him up, and blood and fire starts coming like out lava of him. Lava blood, lava blood, and then he explodes all over the place. And then on like the burned remains, you see a picture drop, and it's a signed like headshot. it's a signed headshot of Johnny Cage that says "To my greatest fan." Now, obviously, what that's supposed to be is. Johnny Cage, it's well, it's actually a reference specifically to Johnny Cage's friendship move. What? <laughs> I don't know. How much do you know about Mortal Kombat? I, I mean, I've told you, I really like, I'm sure I've sat down before and played some rounds, but I have never okay. made an effort with that game. So, series. when the finishing move prompt comes up and it says, finish him or right. finish her. Uh, In the first game, you could do one thing, and that was a fatality. You could either just knock them out and finish the match, or you could do a special combo thing, uh, a special set of of, of button presses, and pull off a fatality, which is like a particularly gruesome way to kill someone. Uh, As the games go on, they get dumber, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and 
those fatalities also like evolve into different kinds of things that you can do. So there's fa- fatality, and then there's like babality, where you turn Baby your opponent babality. into a baby, and then there's animality, where you turn into an animal and oh, kill the person. That's real dumb. And then there's another type that's called a friendship move, where instead of killing uh-huh. them, you do something nice for them. What? <laughs> yes. And Johnny Cage's friendship move was to sign his sign an autograph and hand it to you. Okay, well, you know, that's cute. They're throwing in something from from the games. When I was a kid, I didn't realize that that's what was happening at the end of that battle. And I got really sad because I thought that the the, the signed autograph came off of Scorpion's body. And that (laughs) he he already had a signed autograph from Johnny Cage and he secretly loved him. He secretly was a super fan. He was secretly a super fan of Johnny Cage's martial arts movies. That's what I thought as a kid, and I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> he didn't really want to kill him. Right, exactly. Oh, that's sad. Now, the the following inexplicable scene uh, is uh, the fight scene that you you mentioned briefly between Liu Kang and Kitana, where they exchange. Oh, wow, it's already over. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's already over. And yeah, they, it was they, like one minute. They exchange some blows, and as the fight goes on, they get in these like stop positions where she will give him some hints. She'll drop some hints to him about, like, in the next battle to win, you must use the element that brings life and, you know, that kind of cryptic, stupid shit. Right. And then here we are in the very next scene. Well, the thing I wanted to say about that fight, though, is that apparently battles can end without people dying, and that's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because Where, like, they just Shang Tsung just ended the battle and he's like, Kitana, you disappoint me. Fade to black or crossfade into. It's into like this. it's okay. We're not gonna. I mean, you take all the tension out of situations like that where it's like. That was the thing about the Dark Tournament and Yu Yu Hakusho is that sometimes they were forced to battle people who they didn't want to battle. Right. And there was this conflict going on where it's like, I don't really want to fight this person because he's a good guy and I like him and and like off of off of the out of the stadium, like we've had some moments together that are cool, but I have to fight him because if I don't, then my team will lose and it'll mean like the destruction of Earth or whatever. And they take away all of that potential from this by just being like, well, they don't want to fight each other, so they're just going to, like, dance around each other a little bit, and then it's just over. Like it's the, like, no, you have to deal these, with the fact these, that you have to kill her. These fight scenes are so terrible. Like, there's a ramp that's behind Liu Kang right now that they both ended up, like, flipping down, and the ramp is so obviously, like, red gymnastic mats. Yeah. So clearly, even even so much that like when Sub Zero does like this backflip and lands on it, it gives a little bit, and you're like, "Come on, really? Like, is it that hard to to make something that looks like stone or something a little bit more dangerous than probably what you'd be using inside a studio or a dojo or something?" Right. So, oh, and look, suddenly Katana just shows up, and. And then he does the little voiceover, <laughs> use the element which brings life that we just heard like like 120 seconds ago. Yeah, yeah, it really was. So we've got Sub Zero forming his ice ball, and uh, Liu Kang realizing that water is the element that brings life. Picks up this bucket and throws it into the sphere of frozen air and creates a spear and. Penetrates Sub Zero. I don't know why this would kill him though, because like he is the ice guy. I don't know. You think he could control ice? Yeah. I mean, since his power is controlling ice. You'd think like he would get stabbed and he'd be like, nice try, but. Dude, man, what do you. Like, I am ice. Like, like that's what, my thing. What, 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 man? Like, I mean, didn't didn't you play any RPGs? Don't you know? <laughs> like, your basic elements. If you throw an ice attack at. An ice creature, it's not going to do anything. It's probably going to heal them, actually. Oh, my God. If you look in the crowd, there are a couple of guys that they're, they're shirtless dudes and their hair is slicked back and they're twins. And they spend the entire time that they're on screen just yelling, yeah, Goro, yeah, Goro. <laughs> and they show up in like, I think every single fight scene that Goro's in and they're, they're featured like they're prominently for like a few frames. They're big Goro fans. Big, big, big Goro fans. Oh yeah, I love, I love this whole, this whole thing here, where um, art, where we've got art, and and I remember his name because uh, because I because looked it up. Because this film is R O. <laughs> what I was about to say because this film is a piece of art. Yeah, that. 
um, because I looked it up. But if I had not looked it up, I would have been like, I think this guy was in an earlier part of the movie. Oh, yeah, he's that guy who Johnny Cage talked to for like a second. And they said some things to each other that seemed nice. And I was like, so now that he's battling Goro, clearly we're supposed to care when he dies. And the characters are supposed to care. And Sonya certainly cares. And so does oh, yeah, Johnny she, Cage oh, because yeah, they, they both. both do the Vader no. <laughs> no. no! <laughs> they both do it. Um, this Goro puppet is pretty cool. Like, I, No, I, it is. I appreciate that they didn't do what they did with Reptile and make a really shitty like, 3D yeah, CG Reptile model. Yeah, Reptile is just awful. Oh, man, he's a hot mess. What, 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 what even is that? It's just terrible is like, what it is. I would insult it by saying that it looks like something out of like a ps1 game but i don't even think it looks that good no it's just it's just awful it's really terrible but no i do like scorpion's little hand thing is better than that yeah well not by much though the shot it still sucks the shot where it like gets stuck in the tree that in particular oh oh, it's right it looks like they look but goro looks looks unfinished that's what it looks like no goro looks good and we've said no they're the twins there they are yeah goro yeah yeah We've said before, if you listen to this podcast enough, you you know that we much prefer practical effects to computer generated effects. And I think this movie is weirdly kind of a good example of a movie that does uh, one really, really terribly. The one we don't like really, really terribly. And the one we like kind of OK. Like it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the CG in this movie is just nauseating and, and, the, pract- like, and I, the practical effects are good like, like if, he's if he's you good. remade this movie frame he's for frame fine. now with the i guess the, the the techniques that are most widely used today the money saving techniques especially and the conventions that are used in like this kind of popcorn movie uh movie making i think that even stuff like scorpion's death scene would all be cg like when when uh, Johnny Cage is cutting him open, I think all of that blood and stuff like that would just be CG blood. All of the fire would and just true. be and true, and fire. it's fine the way it is with you know the maggots and all that kind of stuff. Like mm-hmm. it was, you know, that's fine. But all of that was was practical. Yeah, the explosion at the end is pretty dumb, but the explosion at the end was like actually an explosion that they just laid over the film. Like right. it was just an overlay. And Goro, the, the, there we got Johnny Cage's scream. He wasn't really upset about Art dying, but he was upset about his soul being taken. Right. That really I, affected I, I, him. I feel like that shot was taken from another moment because it it doesn't really feel like it's in the right place yeah. right there. It's like, oh, Johnny really cares about this specifically. This very specific thing. It's not his death. Sonya cares about him dying, but Johnny cares about his soul and being And Luke Kane just doesn't care at all. I guess not. Uh, characters kind of inexplicably disappear at random moments throughout the movie, especially like during fights, like if they want to have a one-on-one, if, if right, the filmmakers then, want like a one-on-one later fight when with Reptile someone. Reptile and Liu Kang are fighting. Yeah, like Reptile like, shows up. Johnny? And Liu Kang and Johnny Cage were previously just walking through the wastelands of Outworld together, and then Reptile shows up, and Johnny's nowhere to be seen. And Liu Kang just has his it's own like, little man, fight scene you with him. fight to get two against one, dude. Yeah, exactly. Like, but don't what are you doing with honor and stuff this is like another world what what do you care you could probably explain this this other thing more i guess with reason or logic or something but at the end of the movie when uh Liu Kang has accepted Shang Tsung's challenge for the final Mortal Kombat battle uh Shang Tsung uses this really cheap move where he brings back the souls of you know uh, like i don't know five or so warriors that he's yeah. he's captured over the years and Liu Kang has to fight them, where I guess we don't ever see them during the fight, but I have to assume that Kitana and, and Johnny Cage and Sonya are just standing on the sidelines watching Liu yep. Kang mm-hmm. fight five dudes by himself. Yeah. Like, you'd think they would jump in. Like, I get be it. like, it's man, a- that's not fair. Yeah, like, that's We're going to help. I thought that you couldn't win Mortal Kombat with treachery, and that's, that's kind of treacherous. That's totally cheating. That's totally cheating. So, um, is this is this the scene where Raiden tries to break down all of the characters? No, he did that before, but he's specifically talking to Liu Kang now about Liu Kang's motivations, 
and his whole vengeance quest and all this kind of stuff. And I thought it was pretty funny uh, when they were still on the boat. Oh, the first time he he breaks down their the first time he flaws. breaks down their character flaws or breaks down their reasons for being for going to the tournament and says you can't win the battle if you're if you're totally worried about vengeance and uh, what does he say? He says your enemy, your ego, and your vengeance. But what he really means to say is, Johnny, your ego, Lou, your vengeance, and Sonia, uh, your vengeance. Fuck it, your vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> we can't think of anything else. <laughs> so now we've got uh, Liu Kang once again kind of meditating on his brother's death and thinking about these things, feeling responsible for his brother's death. And uh, I, I just I want to say that um, his whole character arc and coming to realize his destiny and all this kind of stuff is totally in conflict with like every other thing that they say about destiny in this movie. Cause in one line they'll say something like a man has to take charge of his own destiny. Right. And is he's responsible he, for his own destiny. He's responsible and... for his own destiny and the choices that he makes. But then in the next line, they are talking about Liu Kang being the chosen one. And there was a scene, like I think in the scene just before this, when Raiden was talking to Liu Kang, he's like, there's no one else but you. You have to do it. You don't have a choice. Yeah. This is your fate. It's nothing, it has nothing to do with like personal destiny where you make your own destiny by your own choices. Raiden is saying, this is it. Like you, there are no options for you. Which doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. It goes against everything else he's been saying. It's so. either one or the other. You're either the chosen one, and fate has chosen you, and you have to live this. And we out. have a storyline that's based on believing in fate, right? Or, or you make your own choices, like his brother does, and that they totally, you know, kind of make Chan a hero for, like, mm -hmm. like, like eventually uh, at the end of the toward the end of the movie. When Shang Tsung turns into Chan and faces Liu Kang and tries to like throw him off his guard and all this kind of stuff, Liu Kang overcomes it by saying Chan was his own man. He did his own right, thing. Right, he does exactly what yeah. Raiden says and he follows that right. belief of every he, man's responsible for his own exactly. destiny. He made his own choices and he died following his own choices. Except that Liu Kang doesn't get to make his own choices because he's the chosen one. Right. Which do you want? <laughs> Which one is it? Which one is Pick it, movie? Which one. You don't get to have both. You either have a message that's that's pro destiny or anti destiny. One of those two. You don't get to have both. So we we missed it, but like uh, the the shot that's right after uh, Liu Kang meditating uh, over Chan's death and reliving that very first scene from uh, from the movie. Uh, that was our hint. It was like a, a like a really orange, really warm shot of of the ocean with like a big rock crag sticking out of it, and. Uh, for the second week in a row, Taylor Nelson <laughs> <laughs> guessed it correctly from the screenshot. But because she guessed it correctly, I, I think it was literally less than a minute before uh, Justin Bray also uh, guessed it correctly. Uh, I don't know that if, if you saw her answer and just said the same thing. I doubt he did. I think it was probably honest. So uh, we're this week we're going to give it to Justin Bray, who is a listener of the Anime Addicts Anonymous podcast um, that I was a host on for, for uh, a couple of years. So he came over and he's been listening to our show and enjoying it. And uh, so, yeah, he just wants to plug the AAA podcast, which I think we probably mentioned before. I'm sure. And you could find him on their forums uh, under the name Heavy Metal Leo. So you can go say hi to him. Uh, but yeah, back to the movie. So now we're we missed we the missed twins. Our... The twins. They're the twins. No. Yeah, Goro. Go go Goro. Go go Goro. Go Goro. Um, we missed the romance scene. What? <laughs> we missed the... schwa. We missed the... romance. The romantic moment when Johnny Cage corners Sonya Blade and says, "I can't let what happened to Art happen to you, not you." <sighs> Okay. It just really was moving, and um, I wanted to mention it. Oh, what was happening? I was talking over it. What was happening in the scene that ended up with Raiden talking to Liu Kang about like his destiny and all that stuff? He was breaking down their fears, what they fear. Oh, right. Yeah, they do a bunch of that. They do this whole thing, and the, like, the final battle thing is he has to, when he goes to the Dark Tower, he has to face three fears. And and they just keep bringing up this 
theme of fear and just do nothing with it. Like, it's so surface level. I mean, it's even more surface level than, like, the Divergent books, and that's that's pretty surface level. So, I mean, it it's bad. Yeah. Yep, it's uh, it, it's pretty terrible. What did did you did you say like what their fears are? Johnny Cage fears being a fake, right? And what is it, Sonia? Is it Sonia that fears that she needs help? help I guess. It, does, does she really? Is that what it is? Sure. And then Liu Kang fears his destiny. Whatever okay. that means. Sure, whatever. <laughs> I guess. So in this fight scene, we've got, and we haven't even talked about like the special moves, but Johnny Cage does one of his special moves to uh, incapacitate Goro long enough for him to like kind of escape. And what he does is he does the splits and he punches Goro in the dick, which is something that yeah. you can totally do in the Mortal Kombat games, which makes it awesome for an 11-year-old. Just awesome. Being able to punch just people in the dick. Punch him in the dick. Yeah, unrepentantly just dick punching all day. <laughs> Um, and then, because I care, I, apparently these Shokan half people, half dragon creatures have dicks and nuts. Uh, yeah, like, that, like that was my whole thing when he when he punched him in the dick. I was like, oh, so I guess his, he's got a dick and it's there. Okay, yeah. well, good, good yeah, to know. I guess so. Yeah. See, and this is what I'm talking about about people being allowed to run around on the island. Why wouldn't everyone do this? Johnny Cage has lured Goro up to the top of this mountain mm-hmm. and has now kicked him off the side of it and he's going to fall and die. So why wouldn't everyone do something like that? Uh, that's a that's a that's a good question just if you're allowed to just move leave the fight the ring, to a place that's particularly treacherous where you've got the upper hand and right. just make it happen. Yeah, that's a that, that's a good question. I mean I don't but get it. Th- okay, so let's let's talk about. Th- so the last fight that Sonya was in kind of completed her character thing, right? Mm-hmm. Her her, yeah. her desires as a character. That last fight with Johnny Cage, and that is the last fight with Johnny Cage in the entire movie. What does that accomplish for him as a character? Because mm. apparently the movie wants us to think that he's an egomaniac. His glasses got broken. Yeah, it doesn't really doesn't really do the trick, does it? Because uh, if we're meant to think that he's an egomaniacal Hollywood actor type <clears throat> asshole who's trying to prove to the world that he's not a fake, his motivation for killing Goro is that Goro broke his $500 gla- sunglasses? Well, I mean, I guess it's supposed to be that everyone was like, you can't beat Goro. And, and then like, he does. Totally and so he proves he's not a fake by beating the hard guy. Yeah, I, I, and I get that. I guess. But Raiden, in his infinite wisdom, before had said that Johnny Cage will go into any fight just to prove he's not a fake and he will lose. But but he didn't he lose. He didn't lose. So Raiden <laughs> he went, was wrong. Like, he went into that fight. I, I guess he didn't go into that fight to prove he's not a fake. He went into that fight for love. Ah, oh, okay. Because he can't let that happen to Sonya. He can't let it happen to Sonya. Not Sonya's. you. I got it. Not, I got not it. you too. So the power of love is a curious his fear. thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> indeed. So now we've got, oh, now we've got this is this God. this is a hard movie to watch. It is. It is. It hard. is a slog. Yeah, one of my notes in in this movie it was okay. Despite it being a slog, it does kind of move because I've missed a bunch of my notes because the scenes just go so so quick. But I just don't give a shit about any of them, so it still <laughs> feels notes, like a slog. And actually, it's funny that you say that right now because right after my comment about they didn't look like five hundred dollars sunglasses, <laughs> um, my next note was, "Why is this movie so long?" Yeah. <laughs> so was so, that was that yeah. just like stream of consciousness yeah. as you're writing? You're writing this note, and you're like, "This movie's too fucking long. I can't do this anymore." <laughs> yeah, there's um. A few a uh, few interesting little trivia tidbits in this. Uh, Ed Boon, who was the co-creator of Mortal Kombat, actually provided the voice of Scorpion, saying yeah. things like "Get over here" and "Get down here." Hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yep. Also, that was that's another thing that I feel like out of context is totally stupid and weird. Like again, for my father, who I must apologize to for making him see this Drek. Uh, 
But to be fair, he got something out of it, and we're going to bring that up toward the <laughs> we end. Will. He got he got something very special out of it. It, it touched his heart in a very special way, I guess. Um, but uh, that kind of thing, like you know, in the game, when Scorpion says "get over here," it's part of his move. It's a thing that happens. It's a video game. It's stupid. That's that's fine. In the context of the movie, for someone who's never seen it, this like super stoic ninja that's got a mask on and you can't see his face and you assume that he's like super quiet to randomly go, get over here, get down here. And you're just like, what? Oh. That, it's that, really. Okay. It's weird, right? <clears throat> oh, is this our fight with Reptile? It is. Mm-hmm. Um, Liu, Kang, he- Liu Kang heard a sound. So naturally, he just walked over to the nearest wall and grabbed something out of it. And if you look at the the scene where, like, the moment where he's, like, you know, writhing around with the reptile creature, he's not actually holding on to anything. It's just the the CG creature is just kind of floating between his fists. It's awful. Yeah, yeah, it's just and terrible. And then, then he throws him into one of the foam statues that and are littering that the place. And that turns him into a that human. turns him into one of these ninja guys, a, a green one called Reptile. Um, In the games... In, well, at least in the first Mortal Kombat, mm-hmm. Reptile is a hidden boss. Yes, he is. And uh, the way this is, you know, back in the day, it was just by word of mouth that you figured out how to beat him. Or how, not how to beat him, but how to find how to him, fight him, even. Yeah. Just to just to be able to fight him. And you had to meet really extreme conditions. Do you know what the conditions were? I can't remember. I used to know. I um, fought him before when I was a kid. You had to... Get a double flawless victory in single player mode on the pit stage and finish the match off with a fatality. Also, you needed a silhouette flying over the moon, which happens every sixth game. Wow. Word of mouth. That's how people figured that shit out. Yep. I thought it had something to do with the toasty guy. I don't know. That's what Wikipedia told there's me. A, there's a little thing that has something to do with like every once in a while when you do like a... Like an uppercut or you do a particular type of move, a little character will come up from the bottom of the screen. It's probably one of the creators, probably mm. Boone or Tobias. Then he pops up in the screen and he goes, Toasty! And if you do that, I think that might be in the second one. And if you do a certain like button combination when he pops up, you get to fight Jade, which is another kind okay. of hidden character thing. Um, Reptile is also just a palette swap of Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Yeah, of course. That's All the, all the ninjas are just palette swaps. Yeah. That's what I mean. The the thing that people really liked about the game, graphics wise, when it came out, is that it was just it was digitized photographs or it was digitized video of real actors. Like there are real actors that played the characters in the video game, um, and they digitized them and put them into the game. So the game for the time period appeared to have like super realistic yeah, graphics. Yeah. Um, so to, I guess to keep costs down or whatever. I mean, there were only seven. Like, I think it was only like seven playable characters in the entire game. Yeah. And two of them are palette swaps, not including Reptile, who's the secret boss, who's also a palette swap. Yeah. Um, we missed my favorite line in the movie, which was when Shang Tsung kidnaps Sonya. Oh, yeah. And uh, they call him, he says he's going to challenge her to Mortal Kombat. And I think it's Raiden who calls him a coward. <laughs> well, and I'm like, so we, excuse we did, me? We didn't talk about it, but before, uh, Johnny Cage requested to challenge Goro because he didn't want Sonya to fight Goro and then die, which Sonya wouldn't have fought Goro and died because Shang Tsung has been actually keeping her more or less protected. He's The reason he's had a particular interest in her is because he planned, I guess, I, guess, I assume he, I guess planned, he on planned on fighting challenging her. her the entire time so that he would have a basically guaranteed victory in I the mean, final battle. I mean, because what Mortal else is, did he choose her for? He keeps saying that he chose her. Yeah, he chose her and that so, she's special and she's not to be harmed, only humiliated and all this so kind of stuff. So if it's not to... If it's not to do what he's doing now, which is to challenge her to Mortal Kombat, then what was then it like? Why? Marry her or something? Yeah, like that's yeah. I, I got that. Like maybe I got kind of like a slave wife vibe from it. Like I, I guess something like that. But that's never mentioned. It's never like it's never brought up as like a sexual thing at all. So so I I I have to not assume, even like that creepy moment in Super Mario Brothers where he like is talking about her kissing lizards or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You never forget. 
never, never forget. forget. <laughs> I certainly have never forgotten. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So it's kind of weird. I, I I have to assume that Shang Tsung this entire time has been planning on keeping Sonya safe until the end so that he can challenge her to Mortal Kombat and be guaranteed an easy victory. I mean, victory. that's the only thing that makes sense. Because she's a pushover or something like I that? I guess. I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure. That's so, that's so shitty. But I guess everyone knows that. But as far as I can tell, Shang Tsung is also in charge of gathering all of the Earth Warriors. And if he's fighting for the Outworld, that's a little unfair, don't you think? He's the reason, like, him killing Chan is the reason that Liu Kang is going to be in the tournament, and he probably knew that. And uh, he would disguised himself as... I guess Johnny K- Johnny uh, Johnny Cage's publicist or something. Oh, is that what that was supposed I, to I be? I guess that's what he was supposed to be, and told him to to do this tournament, and it would you know make the press not think he's a fake anymore. So if you think about it, Shang Tsung has gathered all of these warriors. He's chosen all of them. But then why didn't he? So he why picked, didn't he just he pick picked... all? Why didn't he pick like kindergartners? Yeah, right. <laughs> like if if you can choose, if you're fighting for one side and you get to choose who you fight, just go to a preschool. Let's. I mean, that's. There's I plenty. don't know. My per, my kindergartners are pretty terrifying sometimes. Oh, yeah, I've so seen them. yeah, that's you yeah, know they, they can be little monsters. <laughs> but they're plastic knives. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like. Oh my God, her outfit. It's terrible. Oh God. You know what it is? It's like a bad of? Slave Leia thing. <clears throat> but no. her hair is all teased out too. Like, why did she have to look like some, like a cave woman? Yeah, or something what like she that? looks like is she looks like a rape victim from a sexploitation fantasy movie from like the oh 60s or God, 70s. Oh my God, she does. Like, like Barbarella or yeah, Death Stalker yeah, yeah. or some shit like that. Oh my God, you're so right. Yeah, that's exactly what she looks like. That's like so she's troubling. about to have like a, a mud wrestling competition <laughs> or something. That's really troubling. Yeah. Oh my god. That's exactly what I thought of. Like I don't think that there's a lot in this movie that's that's all that problematic, I guess. Like I don't find a whole lot of this movie to be like particularly misogynistic except for like specific little things like, you know, Raiden calling Shang Tsung a coward for choosing to fight a woman. Yeah, I choose. God, to, that's so, I, so I choose shitty. to fight Sonya in the final battle of Mortal Kombat. You're a coward. Why? <laughs> God. Why? Because she's a woman. I mean, like she should have been like, excuse, excuse me. The, the really sad part is, is that they don't have to explain it. They yeah, don't that, have to that explain is it. Because like, you're kind of like, yeah, I saw her fighting Kane and she was kind of like... Uh. But I mean, but in the context of the movie, there's no real reason for you to think that she's a pushover. Like she, I mean, she doesn't trust anyone but herself. She goes into this club, guns blazing with that shotgun. Right, but I she mean, takes care of Kano. She takes care she of... I mean, does, she does take care of Kano. That's true. I guess, I don't know, but she, but she's not like, you know, flipping around poles and shit like Johnny Cage and yeah, Luke I, Kang. Yeah, I guess so, but I don't think that the movie ever actually frames her as, as being weaker. weaker than the others. Yeah, that's true. You're right. It no, never right. actually frames her as that, and then it's just left to the audience to understand that, well, she is a woman. Well, she does have a vagina. They don't even have to say it. That's the sad part. Yeah. That's the really troubling part well, is that you your know, audience understands that that's what you're saying without you having to say the it. The creators of the game, she was the, I think she was the last character to be made or one of the last characters. She may have been the last character to be created for the game solely because they were like, oh, uh, I guess we need a girl Ugh. in the game. So um, ridiculous. let's just make up something that is a girl. Yeah. Yep. So that's great. So here's Good. here is the last fight scene of the movie. And it is, I guess this and the reptile fight scene are the closest we get to actually like nicely right. choreographed we're not, fight scenes. We're not scenes. cutting away every second. Well, Robin Show is an actual martial artist. And I, I think he might be one of the only ones. I think uh, actually uh, uh, this car- uh, what's his name? Kerry, Kerry, uh, Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa. I think he's actually a martial artist as well. Um, but yeah, they do a pretty good job. I think I think yeah. this movie could have been like really fun had they decided to cast all martial artists mm-hmm. yeah. instead of like a couple a of martial couple. artists and then like uh, soap opera actors because that's like basically what the rest of them are and Highlander. <laughs> but um, yeah, they don't fight for very long before 
uh, Shang Tsung is like, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. Fight I'm, these other guys. I'm going to resurrect some other people whose souls I stole, and you can fight them instead. Do you know Robin Show from any other movies? I don't know. Do you know, know anything else he's I been mean, in? I mean, maybe if you said the movies, but not like Honestly, off the top of my head. Honestly, I, I understand that he's a pretty well-respected actor in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. um, but the only other movie I think I've seen him in Honestly, and I'm not proud of this, is uh, Beverly Hills Ninja. Oh, dear. With Chris Farley. He plays his brother. He plays Chris Farley's character's brother. Uh huh. Yeah. That's, that's really sad that that's in your memory. I mean, he's not a great actor. He doesn't, he doesn't really do a good job in this, but he does a good enough job. He yeah. certainly doesn't good ruin enough. the movie. Good enough. Um, I think Johnny Cage is the most likable character in the movie. He's got that Tony Stark kind of quality to him. Yeah. I mean, full stop. It, I mean, if, if he really feels like he he feels like he might be the only actor in the movie that knows he's in a bad movie. Well, I mean, he did say the line that he was going to shoot himself for, for being, being yeah, in the movie. Yeah. So he probably read that in the script, and, and he's, he's like, like, "Yeah, this it. is kind of this is it. Yeah, I got it." <clears throat> So yeah, we've got Shang Tsung here who's just watching uh, Liu Kang fight all of these soldiers that he's brought back from the dead. <clears throat> and I've got to assume that his friends are just watching from the sidelines. I mean, we can't see him, can we? No, no, there's a pretty wide uh, shot. No, no, we, uh, well, we can't see him right now, but like we've seen them looking at him a few times. Like they're still in the robe from things. somewhere. Johnny Cage did uh, compliment uh, Sonya Blade's dress, her mm-hmm. slave dress. Yeah. To which did. she scoffed at, mm-hmm. and that's that's that fine. Good. <laughs> uh, this this moment here, for whatever reason, this, mo- <laughs> this moment cracks feels, you up. <laughs> it does. It really cracks me up. But uh, actually, the 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 really funny thing is that Kitana is like, you have to face yourself, and then he says, you can look into my. Oh right, soul, that was his enemy, right? This, so he has okay. to face his, the enemy. His enemy was all of the guys. That he had to right. fight, and then himself now he's was facing, something, I and don't he know runs what... all the way up these stairs. And just... <laughs> I don't know why that gets me. So, like when he says, "You you can look into my soul, but you don't own it," and then there's just this really long shot of him running all the way up like, these okay, spiral I gotta, stairs. I got to get up here to fight you now, so I'm gonna just take the stairs. Just taking just the stairs. Hold on a second. Just taking my time. Just no wait, soundtrack. Wait a second. No soundtrack, barely okay. any foley. Okay, now I'm up. I'm here. Just Let's fight. Just watching him climb the stairs for like a good four solid seconds. <laughs> and then he stops at the top of the stairs and you're like, okay. Okay. Now, now he's here. Now he's in this spot. Now they're ready to continue. And we can do the last section, which was what? No. Face face your enemy, face yourself, and then face, face your, fear. your fear. Right. These are the three trials that he must overcome. Ignoring the fact that they kind of... the dark tower. Br- they brushed over the face yourself. Face yourself, right. They just talked out of that one. They, they did. <laughs> they were just like... They, well, she said, face your enemy. <laughs> and then he fought... And then he fought five dudes. I don't know. Which that, I don't feel like is his enemy. I feel like his enemy Shang is... Shang Tsung just Shang like Tsung, right. pulled out of his head. So that doesn't really work. Face yourself, and that he means just, just deliver of, your next line? He just kind of stood there and was like, you don't own my, my soul. soul. It's, it's like, like that's oh, not... That's the, You didn't face yourself? What, then, you, you should have had like a like a double come in and you have to fight yourself or something. Yeah, and then and then face your fear. And like he's saying all the stuff that we talked about right now where, you know, uh, Shang Tsung killed my brother and that Chan was his own, like followed his own path and every man is, is, right, is in charge of his own. Right, this one works. The face your fear works because his... More, he's afraid of being responsible for right, Chan's Right, he's death. Afa- afraid of being responsible for his brother's death, so his... His fear is then no. Well, it almost worked. Okay, it almost worked if he would have had to fight his brother. Yes. Shang, if he would have had to fight Shang Tsung in the form of his brother, then it would have worked because then it would have been him fighting his brother and being afraid that he's going to be literally responsible for killing his brother. Right. Because he's fighting, fighting him, his, fighting the image of his of brother. The image of his brother. That's right? too smart for this movie. <laughs> there's too much. There's too much symbolism there. Oh, it's so annoying. They should have just let him fight his brother. I mean, wouldn't that be the smart thing to do? Because then Shang Tsung would know that he would he would hesitate and stuff. He'd like pull his punches because he would be worried because it, it really looks like his little brother and. 
But no, he just switches back. Yeah. And then we just get, I guess this is the final form of our final boss. Yeah, he, he and he's kind of weak sauce, but that's fine. He is the movie's almost weak over sauce. and and when the when the final boss is getting this close in a movie this bad, you're like, finally. Yes. Good, just kill him. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's get just, let's get just this over kill with. him. Please. Um he does just, get to use a special just move. Finish him. Um when I was a kid, I was really disappointed that it wasn't like more of a projectile, but Liu Kang when he d- delivers the final punch to Shang Tsung's chest, there's kind of a fireball thing going oh, on. Oh, he he Hadoukens him. Yeah, Hadouken. Uh something like that. And, uh, yeah, in the games, it's a projectile. Like, he actually shoots a little fireball across the screen. But I guess they that, was, that wasn't realistic enough for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he also does uh, one of his other... He does his uh, signature bicycle kick move against, uh, against Reptile. Oh, yeah, we saw that Which is another thing earlier. That's, uh, that's in the games. Yeah, they do... They, I think that this movie does as much as it feasibly can to like give the fans what they want to see in the Mortal Kombat movie. It's like, remember this special move? It's in the movie. Remember this character? They're in the movie. Remember this thing? It's, Man, it's but in it's the movie. Nothing like after after last week we when we did Silent Hill, um, you know, I went back and la- I guess it was last night I turned on the first Silent Hill and mm-hmm. just sat there and was playing for just like the first fifteen 15- 20 minutes of the game and man I forgot how that movie like takes it frame for frame from the beginning of that yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. It is it is just right on it and the feeling you get is just so perfect and in this in this movie it's like I don't know, you can't even compare it. Why am I even trying? There's it's no stupid. point. It's stupid. Brandon Lee was actually supposed was originally cast as Johnny Cage, Brandon Lee being the son of of uh, Bruce Lee, but he tragically died on the set of The Crow before oh. He was able to do this. Um, we did. We did say that we really liked the soundtrack, and uh, you know, in response to that, the film soundtrack actually did go platinum in less than two weeks. Really, it was really popular. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's why so many people. Oh, this is the part, Dustin. Oh no. So I have. Okay. I've mentioned my dad a couple of times, uh, and this will be the last time I mention him. But it has to be said. Um, my father did, in fact, take my brother and I to see this movie. And, and when this particular moment happened, when Chan's soul comes out of the pillar of souls coming out of Shang Tsung and tells his brother that my spirit will always be with you and someday we will be reunited, my father cried. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry to throw you under the bus like this. My father cried at Mortal Kombat. <laughs> you have told this story. Like, I knew this story, like, the first year we were dating. You've been telling this story for your entire life. <laughs> it's just too hilarious. You, you rag on him about this all it the time. It is too hilarious. <laughs> like, he also, like, another one was he cried in, in Jurassic Park, and I can't even remember at what moment that could have even possibly happened. But I don't know. My dad's kind of a softy. He he cries in movies. Not that there's anything wrong with crying in movies. I I don't think. No, I cry any, in movies. Like if a movie touches I've you in a you certain way. I've seen you cry in movies. Yeah, it it happens. It's totally fine. But it's Mortal Kombat, Dad. Go America, red, white, and blue. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird, right? It is weird. Feels like um, it's like sub- weirdly like. So before this subtly jingoistic. this great movie is over, thank God. Um, I I had the extreme pleasure of finding uh the mortal Kombat novel the first like oh, couple no. of chapters and and s- wasting like 15 minutes of my life that i'm never ever gonna get back it's by martin del rio i guess the tagline was nothing in this world has prepared you for this and that was totally true <laughs> Because it was just a heaping pile. Um, basically, the first chapter reads like someone telling you in a very confusing way where you don't know when or why setting and characters have suddenly changed. Basically, they're telling you exactly what's happening in the first 15 or so minutes of the movie. Wow. Yeah, it, it was just... I mean, dialogue was line for line from the movie. So we just got the, the last shot of the movie, which was Shao Kahn, the emperor, coming back and saying, you fools, I've come for your souls. And they say, I don't, I don't think so, Mr. Emperor, we're going to fight. And then they <clears throat> assume the position. <laughs> <laughs> assume the position. <laughs> <laughs> which is bending over to welcome the emperor's phallus, I assume. 
uh, yeah, and uh, then the movie ends. And apparently, that's where the sequel picks up. Like it's the right moment, there, the moment that except yes. different actors with, the, with, with, <laughs> with three of the five actors there, totally different. Uh, and then just kill off Johnny Cage immediately. Yep. That's pretty amazing. But yeah, that was Mortal Kombat. That was a piece of shit. Yes, it was. That's. I mean, if we're talking about in, enjoyability of movies, that this is the least enjoyable movie that we have done so far. Yeah. Yeah, it Bar was none. hard to watch twice. Really, really t- twice in it one day, hard. sweetheart. It was, I feel for it you. was hard to watch it the first time. I mean, you know, I don't remember hating it as much the first time I watched this movie. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe because I was watching it with a critical eye this time instead of just being like, "Oh, it's a stupid Mortal Kombat movie." Yeah. But this time, like, I was having to actually take notes on it, and I was like, "Oh my god." No. <laughs> so it's a whole lot of no. Please don't do that again. But I guess that's uh, that's going to wrap us up. Uh, now that we've reached the end of the movie, we'd like to read a five star review that was received on iTunes. This review comes from Dark Slayer twenty three, and Dark Slayer twenty three writes, "Hey there, popcorn poops. I have just recently started listening, and I'm happy with the decision I made to subscribe to you. I first heard about this podcast from listening to the AAA or the Anime Addicts Anonymous channel, and decided to give you a try. Every episode I've listened to so far has been both a fountain of cinema trivia and just a ball to listen to. You visit." Nostalgic movies many people do not talk about and dissect it with your own criticism while having research on the movies as well. I recommend this podcast to anyone who wants something fun to listen to uh, about movies while at work or cleaning up house. Keep up the good work, popcorn poops. Smelly face. That was really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. If you would like to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, we would really appreciate it. And if it's a five-star review, we'll even read it on the show. As always, you can find us on our website at popcornpoops.com. Please follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook if you'd like to receive updates about the show, including our weekly movie still identification game. If you have a question, comment, or movie request for us, you can reach us on our social media outlets or by emailing us at thepopcornpoops at gmail.com. Next week, we will be wrapping up our video game adaptation month with Hironobu Sakaguchi's 2001 film Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. If you have any questions about that movie or related topics you'd like us to discuss, please contact us through social media or email. Thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye. We are the Popcorn Poops. Hey there, listeners. My name is Ray. And I'm Luke. Together we are the The Super Super Hammered Brothers. Brothers. On our podcast, we talk about video games, anime, comics, and so much more. Hit a clip from one of our episodes. Okay, think about it. When you see the old Batman movies and they're like, hey, I'm Bruce Wayne, 10 seconds later, I get into a custom, hey, I'm Batman. Same voice, same guy, and no one can put the two or two together. It drives me insane. For Christopher Nolan, he's like, hey, change the voice because you got to be different. So, hey, I'm Bruce Wayne to, hey, I'm Batman. You gotta, you gotta do something. It's stupid, but oh, if yeah. you want to oh, stay yeah. hidden and no. you're, Zur- you're Zur- Zur- not known, but that's never how you do Zur- it. Zur- doesn't do that. All Zur- Zur- do is put glasses on. Yeah, d- Hi, Clark. Yeah, d- Hi, Zur- where, where did Where did Clark go? Have you seen him, Superman? What are you, hey, Clark, when did you get here? Did, did you see Superman? He was just here. <laughs> no, it's funny, no, Ray. What the funny, one time he forgets, puts glasses on. Like, <laughs> Super Clark? If you're interested in hearing more from us, go to our website, superhammeredbros.com. You can also listen to us on iTunes, watch us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. Once again, we are the Super Hammered Bros, and we hope you will geek out with us.